Hamas is hugely benefiting from the way Bibi uh, fought this war because every Palestinian civilian who dies for them is an advantage on the world stage. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And as the Gaza war rages on with no end in sight, a rift between the Biden administration and the Israeli government is widening. The Biden administration maintains that U.S. support for Israel remains rock solid. But the same cannot be said for its faith in the country's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu, for his part, has ramped up the rhetoric towards his closest ally, spoiling for a fight. To make matters worse, just this week, thousands of Israelis took to the streets to call for Netanyahu's ouster. An Israeli airstrike in Damascus killed several top Iranian commanders, threatening a wider regional escalation. And another Israeli strike in Gaza killed seven aid workers in a food convoy for the nonprofit World Central Kitchen. But as unthinkable as it is today, the conflict in Gaza will one day end. And how that ending comes about and what comes next is the topic of my interview today with three-time Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times columnist Tom Friedman. But first, what is Bibi thinking? Through the streets of Israel, in the halls of the Pentagon, and inside Hamas's extensive tunnel network, that question looms large. What is Prime Minister Benjamin Bibi Netanyahu thinking? We can't get into his head, so why don't we start what he's saying. Our goal is to destroy the military and governing capabilities of Hamas in Gaza. Hamas has to be eliminated. We have to win. There is no substitute for victory. Israel has launched over 30,000 airstrikes on Gaza since the war began on October 7th, killing more than 30,000 Palestinians, including 14,000 children. Meanwhile, over 100 Israeli citizens remain Hamas hostages. And according to U.S. intelligence, Israeli defense forces have only managed to destroy about 30% of Hamas leadership in those six months. Mark Warner, chair of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, recently told reporters that he was surprised to learn that only, and I quote, a minuscule portion of Hamas's 300-mile tunnel network has been cleared. It's stunningly small, Warner said. Victory, in short, a long way off. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is losing patience with its closest ally in the Middle East. Here was President Biden caught on a hot mic after his State of the Union address. I told him maybe some people even more to come to change. Sir, just look at this. First off, major props to the Biden staffer who swooped in like a helicopter parrot to cut off Biden. That clearly was not his first rodeo. But more importantly, the moment showed just how much President Biden is feeling the pressure to rein in Israel's offensive. 55% of U.S. adults surveyed in March said they disapprove of Israel's military actions in Gaza, 10% jump from just four months before. And with Donald Trump leading in many presidential campaign polls, Biden advisors fear that the Israel-Gaza war will cost him crucial support, especially among Arab voters. Meanwhile, Netanyahu continues to play hardball with his Western allies, which leads me back to my original question. What is Bibi thinking? Well, he's doing what he knows best. He's holding on to power. Because to remain prime minister, he needs to appease a governing coalition of hard right religious nationalist parties resolutely opposed to a ceasefire. While the Gaza war is becoming increasingly unpopular around the world, within Israel, there remains a broad base of support for it. And finally, Netanyahu and Biden both know that regardless of their own frustrations, the United States will continue to supply Israel with billions of dollars in military backing. But how long can Netanyahu's vice grip on power hold? And what, by the way, is the Palestinian leadership's long-term plan? And who will the Palestinian leadership be? Joining me to discuss all of that and more, probably the most important American journalist covering the Middle East. Here's my conversation with The New York Times' Tom Friedman. Tom Friedman, welcome to G-Zero World. Great to be with you, and this is terrific. Uh, we're six months into this war. Uh, how close are we to being able to think about ending it? Nowhere. Um, we, are, we aren't even close to thinking about how to end it. And when people ask me, and how is it gonna end? I tell them, you know, unlike most sort of 
global geopolitical events, you, you can sort of see a pathway one way or another. I have no visibility here. I do not know how this is going to end. And, and that's what I'm really struggling with. I'm listening to the debate here, and I'm really trying to answer a question for myself that's so visible in our own national debate. What's the most pro-Palestinian thing you can do today? What's the most pro-Israeli thing you can do? What's the most pro-peace thing you can mm -hmm. do? Because I think they all overlap. I think the most pro-Palestinian position you can have is to be against Hamas and for the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, for strengthening, building, um, uh, transforming the PA into the most credible, legitimate, um, a functional representative of the Palestinian people. That to me is the most important thing you can do to be pro-Palestinian. The most important thing you can do to be pro-Israeli is to be for the removal of Bibi Netanyahu by the Israeli people and be for a credible, legitimate Palestinian authority that can be a partner for peace with Israel over the long term. What's the most pro-American thing you can be for? I think against Hamas, against Netanyahu, and for a credible, legitimate, authentic Palestinian authority that can represent the Palestinian people. Now, I mean, it's not lost on me that the way you said that implied some level of even-handedness as to the dysfunction uh, and problematic nature of Hamas and Netanyahu. Yeah. Now, one runs a democracy, the other's a terrorist organization. How do we square that? Absolutely. So um, one runs a democracy, the other runs a terrorist organization, and they have had a codependency um, uh, really for the last 15 years, because Netanyahu always understood and actually said um, in his own voice, as of some of his colleagues, having a strong Hamas in Gaza is the best way to ensure a weak PA, weak PA. in the West Bank. And no two-state solution. And no two-state solution. Correct. And Correct. so um, it, that cynicism is there. And for the Hamas... And that cynicism is even stronger, arguably, today. It's, 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 go, it's not been the least diminished by the war. Because it's essential for Netanyahu's survival politically. Exactly, because he now is hostage to a far right in his coalition that is has told him anything that smacks of a Palestinian state or even progress toward a Palestinian state or even progress toward a unified Palestinian position where you'd have the PA in Ramallah in the West Bank and the PA in Gaza is a no-go. We'll throw you out of power. Bibi looks like he's driving the car there. He is not. Smotrich and Ben Gvir, his right-wing allies, are, are calling in out cabinet. left, right, you know, go here. So... Um, yeah, uh, and at the same time, Hamas is hugely benefiting from the way Bibi uh, fought this war, um, uh, which was to take very little care of, of Palestinian civilians, because you know, Hamas basically was ready to sacrifice its civilians, made no preparation to protect them before launching this war, gave them no warning, even though they have this whole 400 miles of tunnels that could have protected people, because every Palestinian civilian who dies, for them, is an advantage on the world stage. It's amazing to me in that six months into this war plus, Bibi and Hamas, their codependency is still a central factor in this war. When I see Israeli public opinion, it's overwhelmingly in favor of continued military action, destroying Hamas, whatever that means. Right. Um, so, I mean, even if Netanyahu were gone tomorrow, how would that materially change the war? I don't think it would change the war that much in the sense that uh, dismantling Hamas is Israel defines as a central security uh, requirement. Imperative. For, for, imperative for yeah. anything future. At the same time, when you're dismantling something, what is your plan for mantling something else in its place, okay? Mm, yeah. If this is a war of dismantlement, unlike all previous Hamas-Israel wars, which were wars of retaliation, Hamas fired rockets, Israel fired rockets, ceasefire eventually. You know, this is a very different war. It says we're gonna dismantle them. But if you are gonna dismantle something, what are you gonna put in its place? And, and Israel has been fighting a war quite remarkably, not unlike our war after 9-11. In Iraq. Uh, in Iraq of uh, having no plan for the morning after. Because having that plan would alienate Netanyahu from his core political base. You know, in the, I've often thought about the worst mistake I ever made in journalism. I went to see Don Rumsfeld, I believe it was on the Saturday before the Tuesday that the war in Iraq was launched. I went to see him at the Pentagon. And I asked him, what's the plan for the morning after? And he um, drew um, all these boxes and lines and squiggles made no sense to me whatsoever. And I thought it was my fault. Because surely the United States of America would, would have, have a plan, would have a plan would for have the plan. morning after. Yeah. 
And I see the exact same thing with Israel here. And when you don't have a plan and you have lots of civilian casualties, rather than saying those casualties are the truly unfortunate byproduct of a war against an enemy who tunneled underneath the ground, but we are fighting this war for a better future for Israelis and Palestinians, mm -hmm. that it's not going to justify it, but it, it gives a different political frame for it. When you don't have that and you have 20,000, 30,000 civilian casualties, however many there are besides non-combatants, it starts to just look like a war of revenge. So um, the, the far right in Israel does seem to have a plan, yes. which is use the war to take more territory. Exactly. Right, it's occupation, it's buffer zone, it's get the Palestinians out, move them to Egypt, move them someplace, yes. they don't have to be in Gaza. Yep. Uh, uh, when you say that they're the ones driving the bus, is that what you mean? In the absence of a military yeah. plan that they essentially de facto are driving what the Israelis are doing? Yeah, well, I would say that that is their aspiration, yeah. their maximum aspiration. Right. Their minimum aspiration is to ensure that the war doesn't end in a way where you have a unified Palestinian decision maker in Gaza and the West Bank under the Palestinian Authority with a lot of global legitimation that could potentially be a partner for a two-state solution. Which happens to yeah. be the aspiration of literally everybody else on the global stage. Exactly. Literally um, everybody yeah, that's else right. that's, at this exactly. point. Whether it's possible or not is a whole other question. A lot yeah. has to be done. And that's why I say to me the most pro-Palestinian thing you can be doing today is working on that project. Because if that project succeeds or makes progress, Many more things are possible in terms of what can happen between Israelis and Palestinians and getting the Palestinians closer to the future of an independent state. If that isn't possible, yeah. nothing is possible. Imagine it were possible. What does a post-war Palestinian solution actually look like? Two stages. The first stage is the UAE, Egypt, and Jordan agree to send troops to Gaza to provide security in a transition um, after Israel would pull back uh, with American logistical help. I think they would require us to provide the, the buses, as it were, the planes uh, and, and, and the intel. Israeli buffer zone? Um, pr initially, probably, and then Israel would have to pull back. So you'd have an Arab security force that mm -hmm. would replace Israel, and then those same countries and the U.S., and again, ideally in Israel, would work with the PA to build its capacity Okay, for ultimately governing and, and building up some kind of security force. And the thing that the Palestinians would do is, um, I, I believe, reconvene the PLO, the umbrella, the sole the legitimate organization, organization, which is, remains the, the umbrella organization, to legitimate, to nominate a Palestinian government of technocrats, not factions, not one Fatah guy, not one this or that, you know what I mean, but of technocrats to actually govern. Um, uh, in Gaza and the West Bank. So I think those are the three things you need. That would be my wish list for a deal. So you're a journalist. Are the Palestinians winning the information war globally? It's a really good question, um, Ian, because there's, I would say there's a short term and there's long term. You know, um, short term, I'm not sure if Palestinians are winning, but I sure know Israelis are losing. That is, you know, they are being seen, there's a shift now, and they are being seen as, as kind of the aggressive extreme party because of the number of civilians who have been killed. Um, but I'm not sure that, even if you look at the polls here, um, uh, it's about 50-50 now, maybe slightly more pro-Palestinian. Slightly more pro-Palestinian yeah. now, um, yeah. But to me, in winning is, are you getting closer to your objective, which is an independent Palestinian state as part of a two-state solution? they're not winning in that sense. And, um, and that, that to me is tragic for them and for Israelis, uh, because to me that's the only way. Because absent that, you know, there's been a lot written, you and I follow these, these commentaries a lot, I know. Um, Palestinian state's impossible. Palestinian state's impossible. All of you writing about a Palestinian state, two-state solution, wasted breath. Mm -hmm. you know, to which I say, first of all, oh, thank you. I, I thought it was a layup. I thought it was easy. I mean, thank <laughs> yeah. you for explaining that yeah. to me. Um, but my, my, my response is, well, then what? then you got a forever war. It's just a forever war. And that's why the way I framed this moment is either we're gonna go into 2024 with some really new ideas, or we're going back to 1947 with some really new weapons. We're either gonna to start to think radically differently about this, or we're going back to the core primordial conflict, not of two states, but truly about who controls the river to the sea. Who controls the land. Yeah, who controls the whole thing. And in that regard, yeah. I mean- but with, I, but, with, but with new weapons. And in that regard, I mean, Hamas and the far right of Israel seem to be the same animal. Oh, absolutely. They're both- they're saying the yeah. same thing. They both advocate 
our control for everything between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Just for different people. Just for different people. Yeah. Yeah. It's a disaster. So, I mean, it's a really hard question to ask, but but in an environment where over 30,000 Palestinians so far have been yeah. killed, yeah. a majority of whom are civilians, yes. a large number of whom are children, yes. thousands yeah. and thousands, yeah. how much is Hamas responsible for the deaths of those yeah. civilians? How much is Israel responsible for the deaths of those civilians? How do we, yeah. how can we talk about that? And the way I talk about it is it's a stain on both of them. Um, it's a stain on Israel for the way uh, it fought this war, um, I believe, with a, a lot of uh, large bombs um, uh, going after very small targets, which ended up in just devastating vast areas of Gaza. And it's a stain on Hamas that launched a war knowing exactly what the Israeli response would be, um, giving no notice for its people, giving no access to shelter in 400 miles of, of, of tunnels. They said, no, that's just for us. Mm. Um, and basically being quite content to drag out ceasefire negotiations, even though Palestinians are dying every day, children, um, uh, to basically um, sustain their leadership uh, and to protect their leadership. Um, it's a stain on, on both of them. I can write the Israeli-Palestinian history for you long, um, or I can write for you short. The short version, going back to 1929, war time out, war time out, war time out, war time out. Mowing the grass, it, mowing war, the grass. War time out, it's all, yeah, it's been. And so to me, it's all, the difference between the two is who did what during the time out. Mm -hmm. So Israel built what was the fourth large, fourth best economy in the world on the eve of the war declared by the economist, you know. And for me, Israelis should always be looking to get to the time out and minimize, doing everything they can politically, militarily, to minimize the conflict. Because they're in a stronger position. Because they're in a stronger position and they have the ability to really take advantage of the time out, you know. Um, and so I, I just feel, but I, again, I understand the existential argument. So war is good for Hamas, time out's good for Israel. Exactly. I mean, just. That's a very good way to put it, mm -hmm. exactly. Hamas does really well in the war. Mm -hmm. Israel does really well in the time out. Yeah. Get to the time out, you know. Or if you're gonna fight what you call is an existential war, and I would question that, it was a terrible thing what Hamas did. Was it existential? I'm not so sure. And not not anyway trying to minimize it, how terrible it was. But when you when you do what Israel did, it reminds me of things that we I did after 9-11. Existential war. We got we just gotta go half a world away and fight these people and do it without a plan. Which was clearly a mistake. Yeah, it was. In every not, way. Yeah, exactly. And in, in retrospect, it certainly didn't work, all right? Or it hasn't worked in any way to justify the cost to us. The thing that worries me, I think, the most going forward is the fact that Hamas has so much more sympathy yeah. from the Palestinian civilians in Gaza to the extent that it's possible to ask them anything right now. You and I can sit here and talk about a Palestinian authority, yeah. but the reality is that the average Palestinian is much more in line right now with blow these guys up. Yeah. Am I, am I wrong about that? Well, certainly when you look at the polls, it would suggest that's the case. But you know, if you actually study um, Hamas's relationship with Palestinians, um, in 2019 um, and in 2023, before this war, Hamas was increasingly unpopular in Gaza. There was a movement actually in Gaza called Bidna Naish, which in Arabic means we want to live. I always distinguish in these moments where who's popular and who's not in between the morning after and the morning after the morning after. The morning after, let's assume Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, survives the war. He comes out, I won, I held off the Jews for six months, whatever he says, people applaud, carry him on their shoulder. The morning after, the morning after, there's gonna be a lot of conversations there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What have you done the, for me? See my house here? Yeah. What, what in the world were you thinking? What were you thinking? I lost my kids, I lost my job, I lost my family. What was your plan for the morning after? Other than to steal a march on the PA in the West Bank? You sacrificed all of us without asking our permission, okay? Without giving us any warning, without giving us any protection. So I, I, I pay no attention to wartime polls. What matters is that poll afterwards. So I can't finish this without asking you a little bit about the broader Middle East. Please. Uh, I mean, obviously yeah. uh, we have seen uh, lots of Iranian proxy strikes yes. uh, against the West, including most specifically uh, the Houthi attacks on the Red Sea. And those attacks have included strikes on U.S. warships. Yeah. Uh, they got a lot of ordnance that yes. they're throwing at. Yeah. What, what happens um, if we see a U.S. ship 
get sunk? What, what happens if there is a major terrorist attack with significant numbers of American casualties? How do you think the yeah. Americans are likely to react to that? What happens? In the so world? let me answer the question on two levels. Sure. One, going back to the, why, what was going on on October 6th in the world? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's an important framing moment. What was going on October 6th, in my view, is Ukraine was trying to join the West and Israel was trying to join the East. Ukraine was trying to join the European Union. And if Ukraine joined the European Union, um, it would be the biggest geopolitical, geoeconomic change in Europe since East Germany joined West Germany, because Ukraine has the biggest land army in Europe now. It has um, the giant agricultural breadbasket and a huge tech sector. While Ukraine was trying to join the West, Israel was trying to join the East by normalizing with Saudi Arabia. Yeah. If Israel were able to normalize with Saudi Arabia on terms that would also advance Palestinian statehood, it would be the biggest change in the Middle East since Camp David. Ian, we are here. It seems like an innocuous year, 2023. No, this is a 1989 moment. This was a pivotal year in the war between what I would call the world of inclusion and the world of resistance. And so how these, how these two balances come out are hugely, hugely important. Now, now let's go drill to down the, to the Middle question, East. So I yeah. was just out uh, in the region with General Corelli, our CENTCOM commander. Mm -hmm. We traveled all over eastern uh, Syria, which is no man's land, and northern Jordan, and visited Tower 22. That got Where hit the by an, got yeah, exactly killed, three, yeah. three American service women got killed yeah. um, uh, in this drone attack. And my takeaway from that trip was because we visited, I think, seven different bases, and they're like little sort of Fort Apaches out there in the middle of the Syrian desert, all designed originally to interdict ISIS. Okay, but not to be hardened against an Iranian attack. Mm -hmm. So the complete strategic mismatch between why the bases were there and now the Iran threat network that they're, they're up against. And I drew the same conclusion that you're, you're saying, wow, if one of those rockets, because Houthis now have land to sea rockets, mm -hmm. they have undersea drones, they have um, suicide patrol boats, they got everything. Um, uh, if one of those gets through, hits a US destroyer and you get a mass casualty right. event, we're at war with Iran. And we know that's plausible. We're at war with Iran. We are, war with Iran. We are, we are with one. With Iran. The biggest thing I learned from this war, first trip I made to Israel after the war, and I saw a friend of mine in the military, said so the thing you have to understand about Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, these are not militias. A bunch of guys walking around in flip-flops and carrying, you know, like we thought of the Taliban or, you know, or, these are armies, armies. With divisions and arms factories. They're actually making their own arms. Not the core stuff, but boy, the Iranians, the Houthis are incredibly adaptive. And they know how to adapt a lot of these missiles. The Iranians give them the, the, the motherboards and whatnot. I mean, they're incredibly innovative. Tom Friedman, thanks for being here. Pleasure, Ian. Thanks for having me. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you've seen, or even if you don't, but you know you need to spend some more time on this conflict and others, why don't you take a moment and sign up for our excellent daily newsletter, appropriately titled, G-Zero Daily.